Hey, what's up, guys? It's Cody Brockway back with another episode of Brockway's Vinyl Bites. Yeehaw! And of course, my uh, my cohort, Mr. Kermit the Frog, is practicing a handstand, so he can't really be with us right now, but he's listening. And uh, regardless, he's happy to be here just like I am. And so, if you watched, if you watched the previous video, uh, this was in the '70s, Prague Rock Edition, 1970 to 72. Well. Uh, today, as promised in the last video, we're moving on to 1973 to 74. But if you haven't watched part one, I'd recommend you go back and watch that now because it was really cool. And uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> and of course, I know this album on my shirt is from 1972, which is a video, uh, an album that we covered in the last video. But hell with it. I wanted to wear it. So sue me. <laughs> anyway. 1973. Saw a lot of great albums come out in 73 and 74. Um... This covers a lot of bands here. Um, well, let's just get right to it. We got the Mahavishnu Orchestra. This is more jazz fusion, but it's really heavy jazz fusion. I'm putting it in prog rock. I love this album. This is the Birds of Fire record. Um, the CD is actually from my store, Second Chance Records, 20 Argyle Street North, Caledonia, Ontario. <laughs> uh, but I had to take the CD home because it is so damn good. The Birds of Fire. You can't. Sorry for the the focus there. Anyway, uh, John McLaughlin. Billy Cobham on drums, Rick Laird on bass, Bobby Bradford on trumpet, Jan Hammer on keyboards. I didn't actually know that. And Jerry Goodman on violin. Billy Cobham's drumming on this is out of this fucking world. It is this album, the guitar playing from John McLaughlin. The songs are so good. This is just, I mean, if this is also acquired taste, okay? But, you know, this is, this is very jazz, but it's very heavy. It's very rock. It's very... You know, lots of prog rocker guys are going to tell you that this album is one of the greatest. So if you haven't heard it, go check it out. It's worth your time, I promise. Uh, 1973, we are going to the first solo album from Mr. Rick Wakeman of Yes fame. Of course, we've got uh, both Alan White and Bill Bruford, I believe, um, sharing some drum duties on this album. But uh, we, it doesn't doesn't say. Yeah, I think that's I think that's correct. But uh, Chris Squire plays on some plays bass on some tracks too. Um, this is the Six Wives of Henry the Eighth by Rick Wakeman, and uh, this is this is an essential, especially if you're a Yes or a prog rock fan. Um, I own this on CD, vinyl, etc., etc. Love it very much. Great record. Rick Wakeman is kind of like a keyboard god. All right, so we're gonna go. Okay, we're gonna go to 1973 here. We are going to talk about Frank Zappa. So, Roxy and Elsewhere, I suppose. Um, that is one of the greatest live albums of all time, but this here is actually the, uh, the complete Roxy performances. So this is everything that's on the Roxy and Elsewhere and then some. So this is full shows uh, from a few nights in December of 73. But oh my gosh, this is, this is seven discs. And uh, I've actually sat for a weekend once and listened to this whole thing over the whole weekend. Uh, just just great. It's just totally uh, fantastic. You got Ralph Humphreys on drums, Chester Thompson on drums as well, who would go and join Genesis a year or two down the road. Um, we got Ruth Underwood and various other guys in the band. Um, Ruth Underwood doing the, the xylophone percussive stuff. Uh, of course, Frank Zappa, Napoleon Murphy Brock. Um, this is this is a lot of people look at this as a big time classic Frank Zappa lineup. He changed lineups many times. And uh, I'd have to agree that this is uh, this is a fantastic lineup of the Mothers of Invention. Um, just totally awesome. If you haven't heard anything from the Frank Zappa at the Roxy, you got to go check it out because mm, epic. So here's an album that everyone's heard. I don't really need to say much about it, but it's uh, it's the lineup of Nick Mason, David Gilmore, Roger Waters, and Richard Wright. Yes, it came out in March of 1973. We got the Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, actually, just uh, the 50th anniversary box set I have in the other room. It's pretty cool. It's got the Dolby Atmos surround remix, and I've never heard music mixed like that in my life. This was totally out of this world. It's, it's one of the best listening experiences I've ever had, was hearing the Dolby Atmos mix of Dark Side of the Moon. And I've had a lot of great listening experiences, i got to tell you, but Dark Side of the Moon, <laughs> one of the highest selling albums of all time. Not much more I can I can say that you don't already know. ELP, Brain Salad Surgery. So this, to me, is the last great ELP album. They have lots of albums after this, um, and uh, they're good. You know, Works 1 and 2 is good. Black Moon, which came out in the 90s, is good. But this, to me, is the last of the studio albums that is my personal favorite stuff. That's, that's, I'm not saying I don't like what they would do after this, but this is just the last of my string of favorite albums of theirs. Um, brain salad surgery uh, when and they would bring this album on the road and they'd, they'd play pretty much the whole thing 
for the most part. I guess they didn't do Benny the Bouncer, but uh, uh, on the live album that would come out after this, they would do Toccata or Toccata, uh, Still You Turn Me On, and of course the whole half hour Carnival 9 thing, but totally great, great classic album, and great drumming, great great bass playing, great, 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 great keyboard playing. I mean, I just can't, can't say enough great things about this band. They're all virtuoso musicians, and uh, I met Carl Palmer, and he was totally awesome. He signed my ELP anthology box set, and he goes, I'll sign that box, yeah? <laughs> anyway, anyway, we're going to 1973 with my favorite band of all time. It's Genesis with Selling England by the Pound. This is the UK Virgin um, edition, so that's why the writing is different around the around the frame, around the bass. This is actually my favorite Genesis album. Uh, usually that could, like, <laughs> this is, yeah, this is probably my favorite Genesis album. Although it is, it is hard to pick favorites, but there's not, like, this is just, this is just something else. I mean, Foxtrot, this, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, Duke, Trick of the Tail, all great albums, but uh, I'd, I'd have to say that this is probably my favorite album by the band. Dancing with the Moonlit Night, I Know What I Like in Your Wardrobe, Firth the Fifth, More Fool Me, which is a solo song sung by Phil. Uh, the Battle of Epping Forest, After the Ordeal, The Cinema Show, and Isle of Plenty. Good God, the prog is oozing out of this one. Um, and they had a little bit of a hit single with uh, I Know What I Like in Your Wardrobe. Of course, they would have many more hit singles later on down down the years of the Genesis um, the, the Genesis catalog. But uh, regardless, I think this is one of the greatest albums of all time. This is a Desert Island album for me. If I had to pick my top five albums of all time, this would be in it. So would The Beatles' Abbey Road. And uh, oh, well, making a top five of anything is hard. But uh, anyway... We're going to continue on with 1973. We're going to talk about, yes, Tales from Topographic Oceans. So Bill Bruford had left the band just at the end of Close to the Edge. And basically with three days to prepare, Chris Squire told Alan White that you're going to join this band or I'm going to throw you out of that window. He would go on to be in Yes for 50 years, 49 years, I guess, till he, till he passed away uh, last year, RIP Alan White. But uh, they would do that tour, and then they'd go back in the studio and immediately plunge into this record. So this is Alan White's first studio album with the band. Uh, his first album overall would be Yes Songs, I guess, but this is his first studio album. And uh, love it or hate it, I think this is one of Yes's finest albums. Um, it's only four tracks. They're all 20 minutes long. <laughs> uh, we got uh, The Revealing Science of God, Dance of the Dawn, The Remembering High, The Memory, The Ancient Giants Under the Sun, and The Ritual, New Sommes du Soleil. Um, sometimes this is my favorite Yes album but that could fluctuate by the day. You know how favorites are, right? But uh, this is totally prog insanity to the tits. I mean, this is just, wow. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good you can't even believe they did it, you know? Anyway, yes, Tales from Topographic Oceans. And we will keep on with 1973. So sorry about the technical difficulties there, but Back on track, we are continuing 1973 with Gentle Giant in a Glass House. This is awesome. This is a great record. Uh, we've got the Shulman Brothers, uh, Gary Green, Kenny, uh, sorry, Kerry Minier, and John Weathers on drums, Ray Shulman on bass, and various other instruments. You know, all these guys in this band actually play everything. Like, my dad used to go see them in the 70s, and, uh, and uh, every guy in the band would just get up randomly and trade instruments. So they all play everything. <laughs> uh, this is definitely a unique album. Um, never quite heard anything like this until you've heard it. And uh, I mean, like until you've heard this album, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, they're, they've, they've always been sort of next level prog. Um, love them or hate them, I think they're a great band and they've had a big influence on, on prog rock as we know it. So. Yeah, if you haven't heard Gentle Giant, you definitely got to go check them out in a glass house. This is a great album by a great band. So we're moving on to 1973 still. We are moving on to King Crimson. So Bill Bruford would leave Yes, and he would join King Crimson. I believe the album... No, I guess this might be his first album with them. But uh, this is one of my favorite King Crimson albums. So he would do three albums in the 70s with them. He would do um, Starless, Lark's Tongues in Aspic, and Red. And uh, then a bunch of albums in the 80s, too. But I think this is a fantastic record, Lark's Tongues and Aspic. We've got David Cross, Robert Fripp, John Wetton, who would go on to form UK with Bill Bruford. And he would also form Asia in the 80s as well. And we got Jamie Muir. 
Um, first time I heard this album, it absolutely blew my mind. Uh, Lark's Tongues and Aspic Part 1 and 2, Book of Saturday, Exiles, Easy Money, The Talking Drum. Um, this is some of the finest, most well-executed music that I've probably ever heard in my life. It's so intricate, it's so complex, but it's so... It's so out there, but it's so, like... I don't know, like, it, it's just... It's so interesting it grabs you when you hear it like especially a song like lark's tongues and aspic every song on this is so good uh but in the musicianship and the songs themselves are just totally fantastic i mean i can't say enough great things about this um of course i'm going to say great things all about about all these because i picked them all but <laughs> anyway fantastic album one of my favorite albums of all time lark's tongues and aspic by king crimson love it the next up we've got from 1974 David Bowie's Diamond Dogs. So uh, maybe you might argue if Bowie is progressive or not. I'd say yes, he is, um, because he always progressed. He never stayed in the same place. He always did what, you know, he was always progressing, and that's what progressive rock should be all about. Not this, oh, I only liked this band up until 1972. Then I got off at this. It's like, no, no, I have a video on, on that type of thing, though, so go search my channel. You'll find it. Um, but uh, he's definitely progressive, that's for sure. Um, we got Diamond Dogs. This is such an such an epic album. We got Future Legend, Diamond Dogs, and Sweet Thing, where he did that, where he did that um, that pitch thing with his voice, which is very different for the for the time that this came out, uh, where he slowed his voice down and sped it back up and up and down, make him sound like a monster and an angel and a monster. You know, he's just he's incredible. Uh, we got Candidate uh, or Candidate, uh, Sweet Thing Reprise, Rebel Rebel, which is a big hit. Everyone knows that song. Rock and Roll with Me, We Are the Dead, 1984, Big Brother, and Chant to the Ever Circling Skeletal Family, <laughs> which would end the album. Uh, this is a great album. If you have this on vinyl and you open it up, and you have the dog nutsack, because he's actually a dog, and you have the little nutsack on your vinyl copy, and it's an original one, that's probably worth a lot of money. David Bowie, Diamond Dogs, 1974. Queen 2 from 1974 as well. Uh, again, like David Bowie, will, will you say if Queen is a prog band? Yes, especially in the early 70s. They were really um, doing something else that no one else was doing at the time. Um, they, the, the Queen sound is so different than any of these other prog bands. But they, they, they still, that, that's what it's all about. Prague is being different. It's progressing and moving forward and just being different than, than what else is out there. Um, Queen 2, this is one of the most fantastic albums of all time. Um, I believe in the same year, they also put out Sheer Heart Attack. Uh, you know, this is when bands were putting out two classic albums a year. <laughs> but uh, I didn't bring out Sheer Heart Attack, but that's one of my favorite albums of all time. Anyway, Queen 2, uh, Procession, Father to Son, White Queen as it began, Someday, One Day, The Loser in the End, so that's side one, which is side white, and then if you have the vinyl, side white and side black. And side black is Ogre Battle, The Fury Fowler's Master Stroke, Nevermore, The March of the Black Queen, Funny How Love Is, and Seven Seas of Rye. Ugh, this is a lot of people's favorite Queen album. And uh, yeah, this is a lot of people's favorite Queen album. And it's one of mine as well. I'd have to say that my favorite might be United the Opera, but we'll talk about that another time. But this is in the top three, at least for me. So Queen 2, Sheer Heart Attack, and United the Opera. Those are probably my top three favorite Queen albums. Um, awesome. Just the stuff that they do with the vocals and the guitar layerings and all that stuff on here. You never heard anything like that in 1974. I mean, I wasn't around, but you just look what was out there. And it, uh, this is so different from everything of the time. 1974, we continue with King Crimson, Red. So the year previously, they had done Lark's Tongues and Aspic, and I guess they had done the Starless record at some point in the same year, but uh, this is the last album before the band would go on hiatus until 1981 when they would reform with a different lineup, including Bill Bruford still. But uh, yeah, we've got the song Red, Fallen Angel, uh, One More Red Nightmare, Providence, and Starless. Totally fantastic. Um, I love this album, and this is when they were just a three-piece, so it was just John Wett and Bill Bruford and, and uh, Robert Fripp, of course. And uh, yeah, so this is the last album of this lineup that we would ever get. <laughs> but uh, anyway, great record. If you haven't heard it before, I definitely recommend going to check it out. 
1974 continues on with Yes's Relayer. So this is a this is a different lineup for the band. We've got Steve Howe, uh, John Anderson, Chris Squire, Patrick Moraz, and Alan White. So um, yeah, Rick Wakeman would leave because he was not pleased with uh, Tales from Topographic Oceans and the following tour. So yeah, he would leave, go do the solo thing. He went on for a couple years, and uh, and they would get a Swiss keyboardist, Patrick Moraz, and they would make this incredible, incredible piece of art. I love, love, love this album. It's, again, it's only three songs. we got The Gates of Delirium. We have Sound Chaser and To Be Over. This is one of the most avant-garde Yes albums. This is, this is prog rock goes jazz fusion. It's super heavy at the same time, and it's... Uh, it's a, it's pretty, it's an acquired taste, as is probably most of this music. But uh, yes, fans know what's up. This is one of the greatest albums the band ever did, and uh, they would continue on a streak of greatness for many more years to come. So we got Genesis, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, 1974. This is the last album that they would do with Peter Gabriel uh, before he would leave the band and go on and go on and embark on a massive solo career. Um, so this lineup is still Peter Gabriel, Tony Banks, Mike Rutherford, Steve Hackett, and Phil Collins. Um, they would go do the tour for this. Then Steve Hackett would make a solo record, stay in Genesis for three more years, and then he would leave the band as well, but that's way down the line here. This is an incredible album. It's a long album. It's a long album. It's a double disc. Um, and look at all the tracks. I'm not, I'm not going to read every track, but uh, some of the highlights on here. we got The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, Broadway Melody of 1974, which is, of course, part of Flying a Windshield, right? Uh, Cuckoo, Cocoon, In the Cage, Back in New York City, um, Counting Out Time, Carpet Crawlers, uh, Lily White Lilith, The Light Dies Down on Broadway, The Colony of Slippermen, The Lamia, Anyway, It, yeah, I read almost the whole album, but uh, this is this is a great, fantastic album. If you got about an hour and a half um, and you've never heard this before, I definitely recommend sitting down and, and, and going through this album. It's a concept album about a guy named Rail who lives in New York City, and the stories of what happens to Rail is so hard to keep up with, but the music is totally fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, if you're a Genesis fan, of course, you already know this album, but um, I definitely recommend going and giving it a listen for sure, because it's one of the greatest, one of the most defining prog rock albums ever. And we're going to conclude this video with... so. 1973 and 1974. This is two albums on one disc. Um, so this gentleman was in, was in a band and it was making a solo album at the same time. So this reissue actually has both of those albums because they were recorded virtually at the same period, 1973 and 1974. The Mothers of Invention and Frank Zappa, we've got Apostrophe and Overnight Sensation on the same album, on the same CD. Two of the greatest albums. Uh, we got Chester Thompson. We even have the Tina Turner and the Ikeettes uh, doing vocals on Dynamo Hum. Uh, I'm a huge Zappa fan, and uh, this this is actually probably the first Frank Zappa that I had ever heard. This used to belong to my dad. He gave it to me when I was a teenager, and uh, this is just totally fantastic. So this is the Apostrophe album cover on the back, and this is the Overnight Sensation cover on the front. Uh, Camarillo, Brillo, Dirty Love, uh, um, I'm the Slime, <laughs> Stinkfoot. And it's it's jazz fusion gone rock with hilarious lyrics. I mean, what more could you want, <laughs> right? Anyway, love me some Frank and love all of these, uh, love all these albums. And uh, so anyway, yeah, thanks for watching. And uh, and uh, did you agree with my picks? Would you have more that you would add yourself? Let me know in the comments. Feel free to like and subscribe. And I'll see you again next time with 1975 to 1979. Thanks for watching and rocko.